early in the morning. I'm not really a morning person, but um, as I told my wife, I actually like to have morning lectures because uh, that way I can get my work done before I'm actually awake. So, so I've got my tea with me here, and I, I hope I can entertain you a little bit. Now, how many of you folks are here are, are from Denver? It's Denverites, right? Okay, a lot of Denverites, a lot of Coloradans here. Put your hand up. Okay, good, because I come from Vancouver, and there's a very uh, famous... Um, Denverite, uh, was a Denverite uh, for a long time, uh, that uh, grew up uh, very close to me. Do you know who I'm talking about here? He's pretty famous in Denver, Colorado Rockies, a guy named Larry Walker. Thankfully, Larry, yeah, Larry just inducted into the Hall of Fame. So a little shout out to Larry Walker, one of my fellow Canadians, for making it into the Hall of Fame. I think only like 393 home runs or something like that. But, and that speaks a little bit to the fact that I'm a... Uh, uh, I'm a, a kinesiology professor as well, I like sport, uh, but I turned my science and, and my research to nutrition about 10 years ago when I was taken down the rabbit hole uh, by um, uh, a fellow who t who's actually studied uh, First Nations traditional diets. And the First Nations, especially in the north of Canada, absolutely have a, a, a ketogenic diet, 70 to 90 percent saturated fat in their diet. And interestingly, on that diet, no, no disease really, no diabetes, no heart disease, no obesity. Uh, no Alzheimer's, they live long, healthy lives. So, um, uh, and then I was taken down the rabbit hole and, and I ended up bumping into a couple guys you might be familiar with, uh, Dr. Jeff Volick and Dr. Stephen Finney, and they kind of greeted me at the other end of the rabbit hole and they told me, you gotta change your research and you gotta start looking at this, this is the future. And I completely agree. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, some of the research that I'm associated with, which is uh, looking at uh, the therapeutic benefits of ketogenic diets. Uh, I counsel people on ketogenic diets. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about a study I'm involved with uh, in collaboration with Dr. Jeff Volick at the Ohio State University, and I've been trained to say it that way. So, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, Jeff's been very kind. He's a super guy if you ever met him, and, and if you haven't, you should because he's just great. So, um, so just to get started now, there is this little bit about COVID-19, and that's because the lab I work at at the um, uh, BC Cancer Research Center in Vancouver which, by the way, I'm not sure if you know, but British Columbia has the best cancer outcomes on the planet for most cancers, and a lot of that is due to the research that's going on at the BC Cancer Research Center. We're a true leader in cancer research. Uh, I'm at the University of Fraser Valley, so I'll just switch over to, um, to my uh, affiliations. Um, and you'll see in the bottom, uh, bottom right there the Canadian Clinicians for Therapeutic Nutrition. This is a Canadian kind of version of the Nutrition Coalition. Now, how many people know about the Nutrition Coalition? Okay, listen, I think we got to give Nina Teichschultz a huge round of applause. <laughs> Nina, I, Nina I, hope you're, I, I hope you're watching the live stream, Nina, because you have, you have worked tirelessly to try and advocate for, for better policy. Um, and and I really, we all really appreciate that. So um, here's my disclosures. Um, you know, it's difficult when you're researching ketogenic diets to get federal money in the United States or in Canada because they're advocating uh, in their policy for, for still low-fat, high-carb diets. So uh, our funding is, is from the John and Lottie Heck Foundation, for which we're really grateful. I have no other disclosures other than the fact that I've written a book called BioDiet, which is really a, a how-to uh, but a why to for ketogenic diet. So what, this is for the lay person. And how many physicians do we have here today? Lots of physicians, great. You know what, because in my mind when I was writing this, I was writing it for you because I teach all the pre-med students and so on. I teach uh, anatomy, physiology, pathology, health. And I, what I realize is that you don't get a lot of nutrition education in med school. So I said, well, we need to have a, a kind of a guide for you to talk to your patients. So what I'm, I'm really just a teacher. I'm just a humble teacher, and so what I need to teach are some simple stories and some simple models that help get those ideas into people's heads so that they can take them home. And uh, I'll show you a couple of those today. So why consider a ketogenic diet? <clears throat> I'm a scientist, I'm only interested in the science. Man, when I, when my PhD is in mathematical biofluid dynamics. I went to Cambridge University as well as a postdoc there. Uh, when I came into nutrition science, I looked at the whole field and I said, this is just muck. I'm looking for evidence-based stuff, you know, randomized controlled trials and so on. I don't see any of that here. I spent two years looking for, looking for this notion that saturated fats cause heart disease. Two years I spent looking and I, well, you could spend 10 minutes because it's not there. I'll tell you, just save yourself, save yourself the time. There's no good robust science to show that saturated fats correlate with uh, uh, coronary heart disease. Um, so the health benefits we know about, other people you're talking about it, we know it's the best weight loss and control. Uh, uh, we know about the, uh, the biomarkers for triglycerides, triglyc uh, uh, cholesterol, uh, and HDL. <clears throat> we know um, 
And I believe, uh, uh, you know, Sarah Hallberg's going to be talking later about the, the stable blood sugar and stable insulin, done some great work at uh, Indiana University and with Verta. Um, less systemic inflammation and, and the pain that goes along, along with that and, you know, the improved energy, stamina, better sleep and all kinds of other things. And one of the questions I have now, um, I'll get to a little bit later, but, you know, this is in, we, you know, that we're having the COVID-19 uh, experience right now and I don't mean to take that lightly, but how many people here are keto adapted and have been for, say, two years or so? Can you put your hands? Okay, that's great. Now, how many people have noticed that they're not getting the same flus and colds that everybody else are getting. So, you know, let's turn around and look at everybody else. It's almost the same people. And I notice the same thing, too, and I keep telling uh, Jerry, you know, I just, like, I haven't had a sniffle since the first Obama administration. <laughs> so you can count back. It's about eight years. And, you know, everybody else around me kind of gets the flus and sick, take time off. I just don't get it. Now, how many of those people, here's another interesting question, how many of those people felt like they were getting sick they had the aches, chills, the headache. They go, oh, man, i got to cancel everything tomorrow. And then you wake up tomorrow and you feel fine. How many people experience that? See, same people again. Why? Do you know what that is? That's gamma interferon. And I'll talk about that in a second. So here's the sort of model. This is a nice model if you want to take a picture of something um, from the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition showing the various areas where we're studying um, uh, ketogenic diets in a therapeutic way. There's, there's, there's about 30 or 40 different diseases that are being studied right now. The stuff on the left is that for which there is uh, very strong evidence. So diabetes, for sure. And, you know, thanks again to Sarah Hallberg and her team and Amy and the rest of the group at Verta for, for doing the really great uh, science to show that. Um, the cardiovascular risk parameters, I, I mentioned those already, lower triglycerides, higher HDL and some others. Uh, weight reduction, for sure. Epilepsy, you know, it's been used for over 100 years for epilepsy. And, you know, Eric Kossoff at uh, Johns Hopkins has been a leader there. So in the, in the, um, on the emerging side on the right, um, and if you look, you know, it's kind of small, but if you look at the mechanisms, it's all the same thing. It's all anti-inflammatory. It all addresses insulin resistance, and it all addresses, like, weight loss and obesity and so on. And so there's now emerging evidence that it's a good therapeutic for acne. So, you know, kids are getting bad acne, and they stop eating fat because they think that's related to it. Now, take them off sugar, and you'll be surprised how much that acne clears up and how quickly. Um, neurological diseases, all kinds now. Parkinson's, even autism is being studied. Uh, PCOS, uh, which is really uh, due to insulin resistance. So if you can address insulin resistance, you can address PCOS. And then my area of research, which is cancer, and uh, it's actually, I, I love the fact that Dr. Lustwig was talking about this yesterday. You're going to see a lot of the same themes here today. So here's my question to you, and I have an answer, because never ask a question unless you have an answer, right? So, so the question is, politicians should follow that. Uh, uh, like especially the, you know, Cameron in, in Britain. Don't ask a question unless you know the answer. So therapeutic, uh, ketogenic diets are effective therapeutic for neurological diseases and for metabolic diseases. And I consider cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and so on, all to be metabolic, yes, including cancer. And Dr. Lustwig spoke to that yesterday. So the question then is, what do they have in common? So I'm a design thinker. How many people here are, have an engineering background? Because a lot of engineers come to keto. You know why engineers come to keto? Because they're design thinkers. Because they look for the root cause of a problem. That's what they're trained to do. And that's what design thinkers do. So if I keep looking back and I look inside the body and I look inside the organs and tissues and down to the cells, down to the molecules, I see one thing that unifies all of this and it's the mitochondria. Uh, these are our frenemies within. If you know the kind of, you, if you know your first year biology, you know these are some sort of little bacterial things that got absorbed into our cells way back in evolutionary past. And they now, they actually have some of their own DNA, they have some of their own genes and so on. Um, but they work within our cells, they divide within our cells, they have their own little life cycles. They're our frenemies within. If we look after them, we will be healthy. If we don't, we will get sick. And I actually think that all of these chronic diseases, you know, as, as physicians or clinicians or even physiologists like me, we like to categorize things. Diabetes, that's high blood sugar. You know, cardiovascular disease, that's, you know, something happening in the blood. But these, ladies and gentlemen, are all the same thing. That's what I believe. I believe that all of these chronic diseases are the same thing. We're starting to see that now. We're starting to call Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, thanks to Suzanne Delamonte at Brown University. So, if there's, a, if there's a, one of my take-home messages, it's that. I think in the next 10 years, you're going to see a lot of medical research looking at the mitochondria, as Dr. Lustig is doing, and that's where we're going to find the root cause of chronic disease. So here's the model I have. 
And uh, I'll tell you when to take a picture of this because I want you all to go home with this and talk to your patients. This is how simple it is, folks. And I've talked to researchers and clinicians and physicians all over, all over the world now uh, about this. And I present this model. Now, go, all, especially the physicians go, yeah, yeah, you know, obesity, insulin resistance, inflammation. If we can do something about those, that's like 70% of chronic disease we could address. Think of the savings to the healthcare systems if we could address those three things. So we talked about obesity, we talked about insulin resistance. We haven't talked a lot about inflammation today. So how do you know if you have these? Well, obesity is easy. You take your clothes off, you stand in front of the mirror, you turn sideways, and there's your answer, right? Because that's the obesity we're talking about. It's, it's mid-abdominal obesity, uh, that visceral obesity that's important, and of course, in the, in the liver, as we learned yesterday, too. Um, how do you know you're inflamed? Well, you know, as you're getting older, uh, you know, like I'm starting to get older, you start to hurt. And people have sort of come to the conclusion that that's just a natural pro process of aging. You get old, you get aches and pains. You don't have to, folks. That is, that is due to inflammation, what we call chronic systemic inflammation. Most of that is due to excessive carbohydrate that's been circulating in your blood that causes things called AGEs, advanced glycated entities. And again, Dr. Lustig spoke to that yesterday. And that uh, creates a systemic immune reaction. Plus, Half of the cells in that fat are macrophages, and they're releasing all kinds of nasty stuff that's making that inflammation worse. How do you know if you're insulin resistant? Well, that's a little tougher. You know, we talked about some tests. Mark talked about those yesterday to look at if you're insulin resistant, what happens. Generally, we look, you know, at your blood sugar levels. But personally, if you're getting brain fog, that's probably insulin resistance of the brain that's starting. That mild cognitive impairment or even pre-mild cognitive impairment, that's probably a sign that you're becoming to, your brain is starting to become insulin resistant. And you can reverse that. Because you know when you go on ketogenic diets, my friends call it the Harper High. All of a sudden they just go, oh wow, I woke up one day, Dave, and I, I just felt fantastic. I go, yeah, now your brain is burning ketones, which it likes to do and prefers to do with less reoxygen, reactive oxygen species and so on. And so, uh, so your brain works better. So it's like switching from a gas-powered car uh, to an electric car, and suddenly your brain's working better again. So what happens with this? I call it the axis of illness. Remember George Bush II and his axis of evil? You know, I think it was North Korea and Iran and Iraq, and then they threw some others in after the fact. Um, so I call this the axis of illness. So this is the recommended diet. Um, and still out there in Canada, uh, the US, and elsewhere, really, this is the high carbohydrate diet that's being recommended. And what happens if you eat a high carbohydrate diet uh, to this model? Well, as you might think, they all get worse. <clears throat> and you end up with chronic disease. So about 70% of chronic disease is due to these three elements. Those are the big killers. And uh, again, if we can do something about that, that's great. Now the other thing, you'll notice those arrows are going in all directions. And that's because we know obesity makes insulin resistance worse and vice versa. Obesity makes inflammation worse, as I just explained, and vice versa. Insulin resistance and inflammation are tied together. And again, Dr. Lustig showed some of that yesterday. So uh, this is the model, the simple model for disease. And you can tell your patient, and this is what, you know, we now call this you know, metabolic syndrome or whatever, but these are the three things, and you can look them up. You just go and Google how many chronic, you know, what percentage of disease is due to inflammation, and it'll all come up to 70%. So think, if we could address these three things, then we would be able to sell the health, healthcare system a lot of money. And listen, we're all here to help people have healthier, happier lives. So this is the message we need to get across. So here's the good news, the really good news about ketogenic diets. If you look at that model, the axis of illness, what happens if you take carbohydrate out of that model? If we reduce the carbohydrate load, and I would agree with Dr. Lustig, especially sugar and high glycemic index starches, what happens with that? Well, they all diminish. And because there's this vicious cycle that makes them all worse, when you make them better, they all get better. And we've seen, even within a few weeks, um, how many people have treated diabetics that have seen, you know, significant improvements in three or four weeks? Again, and, and if they're improving there, they're improving their insulin resistance, then their inflammation's going down, their obesity's going down, it all, it's, all, it's all connected. And it's all, what you're doing is you're feeding your mitochondria the diet your mitochondria wants to eat, and if you do that, your mitochondria will be happy and you'll be healthy. So, uh, again, the chronic disease is greatly diminished with a ketogenic diet. So this is my model. Please share that. Now, um, I'm not that smart. I'm not the first person to come up with this. I just put it on a picture and put it in a book. Um, you've, you heard about Dr. Lewis Cantley yesterday, uh, and you know this is a long time ago in Time Magazine, but just to show you, 
that I'm not insane, because you know, Dr. Cantley is likely to be nominated, if not win a Nobel Prize at some point for his discoveries, but you'll see those same three elements, insulin resistance, obesity, and inflammation uh, aggravating tumors. Interesting, huh? Uh, I take the butter out of that, because I actually think grass-fed butter, I crave grass-fed butter. <laughs> so I take the butter, I just move that pot there right up top and make that responsible for everything, then Dr. Lustig will send me birthday cards, right? It's really about getting sugar out of your diet. So, now, physicians know this. The lay public does not know this. Cancer cells are addicted to glucose. That's because they don't have the same metabolic flexibility as our other cells, so they're dependent on glucose for fuel. Anaerobic respiration, or fermentation, as Otto Vorberg talked about in his 1931 Nobel Prize winning, uh, about the fact that cancer cells are fermented. Now, not all cancer cells. About 60, 70% of cancers, mostly the solid tumors, the liquid tumors, you know, lymphomas and the leukemias, maybe not so much, but for sure the, uh, the solid tumors. So this is, and we know this because we use this to image tumors. We use fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a radioactive tag glucose. We put that in the patient. Uh, the cancer cells will concentrate that uh, a couple hundred times, and, uh, and then we can image the tumors. And this is not one of our studies. I'll show you one of, those, one of those later. So we know cancer cells love glucose. So why would we want people to eat a high carbohydrate diet if that's going to feed cancer cells? And by the way, and again, the physicians know this, you get cancer cells all the time. You all have them in your body all the time. Your immune system is designed to find those and kill them before they become a problem, before they're bigger than about the size of your thumbnail. And it's pretty good at doing that. Uh, but it's your immune system ultimately that wins the day. Your immune system has to be healthy, and we're trying not to aggravate the tumor growth. Okay, so this is your, uh, first your biology, normal metabolism of the cell. You've got your fermentation or your anaerobic respiration on the, on the left. Um, you've got your oxidative respiration on the right. Um, you'll see glucose is the fuel. Most of it is burned down into carbon dioxide, which then you know, gets released as uh, bicarbonate, which makes the micro environment around there a little bit basic. Um, and Bob's your uncle. That's how most cells use uh, glucose. That's fine. It does create some oxidative stress, though, within the cell when they do that. Um, this is cancer cell metabolism. Again, not the same metabolic flexibility. It, it doesn't use oxidative respiration. So it really only uses glucose as a fuel. And remember, these are very metabolically active cells, so tons of glucose. Uh, and as a result, it produces lactate because it's just going under, undergoing the anaerobic respiration. Uh, and then glutamine is you know, the amino acid it uses to build all the cell components and so on. So those are the, if you want to look at cancer as a metabolic disease rather than a genetic disease. You know, for genetic disease, there's thousands of pathways we can look at, thousands. And we can develop all these fancy drugs, and they all work, but the problem is they work for like six weeks, six months, and then the cancer cells are smart and they figure a way around that. But if you look at it as a metabolic disease, we can tip that balance of power in favor of your immune system by uh, creating an environment that's hostile to cancer cell growth. So one of the things, for instance, just lysine, Lysine uh, will help uh, with the lactate and, and change that because cancer cells need an acid environment. So that's one thing that you can do as a, as a nutraceutical, I guess. Uh, so that's the other way. We, 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 we know about um, how you can sort of look at the glucose side of things here, but glutamine is another opportunity to look at how we might be able to interrupt glutamine metabolism in cancer cells. Okay, so I said I'm a teacher and I have to come up with simple models, not for my students, but for me, because for me to teach it to somebody else, I have to understand it. So I was thinking about it, well, what, is this, what does this story look like? And I thought, well, we all have gardens and we have flowers in our gardens, you know, even if you live in an apartment like me, uh, you have your flowers and you have the, the, you know, the plants you want to have growing there. And those are your normal body cells. So all the healthy stuff you see there, those are your normal body cells. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's the ideal healthy body. So on the, on the right, we have the sun. And, you know, thanks to Einstein and photosynthesis, we know that the sun is how plants produce glucose, so there's your fuel. But on the left side, that's insulin. And insulin and insulin-like growth factors, these are very, very powerful growth factors. So when you're talking about cancer, you're talking about a need for rapid growth. So insulin and glucose both promote the growth of cancer cells. Insulin and glucose both promote cancer cells. So it looks kind of like this. So this is on the high carbohydrate diet recommended now. What we're doing is we're brightening that sun. This is the Vorberg effect. We're providing more glucose to those growing cancer cells. 
uh, because your blood sugar levels are high. And when your blood sugar levels are high, as we all learn in biology, that the insulin goes up to take that sugar out of your blood. So now we're increasing the amount of fertilizer. So you've now created this environment whereby you have the optimal growth environment for cancer cells. All the food and fuel and fertilizer they need to grow, right? And so the balance is tip. And what happens over time? The weeds win. The weeds are the cancer cells. This is a kind of a, a simple model for a metabolic view of cancer. So what happens on a ketogenic diet? Well, you guys are all pretty wise about ketogenic diets, so we know that you're lowering, you're not taking it to zero, you're lowering the sugar burden in your blood, the blood glucose levels. So those diminish to a base level. Whenever I have minor tested, four, do it again, four, glucose tolerance test, four, and then four, and the rest is ketones, because I burn, I'm about 1.52 all the time. I've been uh, ketogenic for about eight years, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and that also, when the sugar goes down, the insulin goes down. So now you're reducing those growth factors in that fuel and fertilizer, as I call it, for the, for the cancer cells. Now, what we've also discovered in our lab, I'll show you a, a picture in just a moment, is uh, our immune system is designed to kill the cancer cells. So I'm using an analogy of a weed whacker there. And uh, so there's your weed whacker. That's your immune system. And so what happens is, if, if it works right, that immune system gets upregulated. And you guys just demonstrated that today. It was, it was hardcore science. I asked you, you all put your hands up. That's science. That works in nutrition, right? You just ask people, they put their hands up, and then I think that's that. So we proved today that people on ketogenic diets have increased resistance to infectious disease in that hands up thing. Why is that, though? And that's the good thing about working at one of the leading immunohistology labs in the world, is I can go in and just you know, get them some blood, and they'll test it. And we did that with a bunch of people who were keto-adapted, and we had a look at it compared to the general population. And I'll show you that. So what we've seen, in general, is an upregulation of the immune response. So we kind of turbocharge that weed whacker, and it goes through, and it weed whacks all the weeds out, and it kills the cancer cells before they can grow and cause, cause problems. That's, that's the simple metabolic model for cancer and how ketogenic diets work. And that slide took about a week to make, so I hope you appreciate that slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, those are the good slides. I'm always teaching my students you know, how to make nice slides. I'm going to show you some lousy ones, too, in a minute, um, just to show you I'm far from perfect. Um, actually, we heard about this yesterday, too. The beta-hydroxyburic acid, that's the main ketone. It's actually not a ketone. You know that. It's ketone body, right? But that has benefits that are anti-cancer that we also know about. And we've proven this at the cellular molecular level. It upregulates AMPK, that AMP kinase. It downregulates mTOR. mTOR is a, a basic, you know, giant black hole of growth factors in your cells. And the AMPK itself also downregulates mTOR. Uh, the other thing that we haven't discussed yet is the downregulation of HDAC. Uh, histone deacetylase, and what that does uh, when you downregulate that is it allows the uh, anti-cancer genes to be activated, uh, and that's important too. That's kind of an epigenetic effect that we've also discovered. And so this is our team at, at uh, you see at the top, the V, it is The Ohio State University, um, <clears throat> Dr. Jeff Bullock. Now, and you can see where I fit into this. You know, it's what I always had, every time I've ever had a lab anywhere, it's always in the basement. So there I am down in the basement with our team at the BC Cancer Research Center. Uh, Dr. Jerry Crystal, if anybody knows who he is, he is uh, an amazing guy. He's in the mid-70s, and he's like a god in cancer research. He's done all the low-carb cancer stuff, uh, but he's only ever worked with animal models, so that's why we teamed up, because I work with humans. That's Ingrid. Uh, she's our postdoc that does all the heavy lifting, and, and I really just go and tell jokes. You know, it's, I keep everybody happy. But Jeff... Um, um, uh, and his team at, 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 at Ohio, they, uh, so uh, Parker Hyde, I'm going to show you some of his slides today, Ryan Dickerson, uh, they're the main ones on the keto care study, which I'll just show you a few slides of. At the bottom there too, we, we have uh, the first clinical use uh, of a digital PET scan, which was at the Ohio State University. Michael Knopp invented that and developed it uh, with Siemens, I think, at, um, at, at the National Institutes of Health. And Miriam Lussberg works at the uh, Waxman uh, Comprehensive Cancer Research Center in, in, in Columbus. So this is what we do. We're taking um, patients, uh, we're feeding them, uh, and we actually provide all the food for them. So it's a very controlled study. We're measuring everything we possibly can. And we do that for three months, and we met, they do blood draws and, and uh, PET CT scans, then we do it again at six months. I've got one slide I'm gonna show you here in a sec. Um, this is where we prepare all the food. All the food is prepared uh, in an industrial kitchen at the university. So the patients come in, they get their food every three days, and that's all that they eat. 
uh, we weigh everything before and after to a tenth of a gram. So we know exactly what they're eating and they send the dishes back dirty so we can weigh them again. We know exactly what they're eating. Very highly controlled. This is a DEXA 400 to measure their body fat. By the way, you know, don't use BMI anymore. Like I'm a kinesiology prof. We haven't used BMI for like 20 years. You need to use some measure of fat. There's one that's pretty good called relative fat mass that came out of cedar cyanide. It's easy. It's just height and waist. Use that one. Uh, so I asked, you know, what's a, I know what a DEX is. What's a DEX of 400? They said, well, that's for people that are 400 pounds. I never knew those even existed. So. And there's our digital PET scan. As I said, the first time we've used that. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's very Star Trek-like. Um, so here's the one slide I'm going to show you. This is the one. We, we, we have 20 women in the, 20 women in the uh, experimental side, uh, 20 women in the control side. Um, and this is a three-year study. And to do that, uh, even just feeding those people for three, that's a million dollars. Well, it's a million Canadian dollars, so you know, it's a little less in the United States, but, but uh, um, we'll see how that happens. So this is a woman. You can see the hypermetastases in the liver. You can see, obviously, the brain glowing uh, because the brain is glucose. You can see the kidneys clearing the imaging agent. You can see the little uh, portal that we use to put it in in the armpit there. And you can see these hypermetastases, very common in breast cancer. Um, and by the way, my mother died of breast cancer when I was young, when I was nine years old. So to be able to now research breast cancer, I think, is, is, is pretty exciting for me. Um, it's one of the leading cancers, as you know, uh, uh, and leading cancers for women, too. So this is uh, just one of the studies, and I, I, you know, it's, it, it, we don't know who it is. It's anonymous, but, um, and uh, I don't have all the data. You know, I don't want to jump the gun here. These guys will be done at the end of the year. You'll start seeing the stuff next year. It's going to be fantastic. Um, but this is after just the six weeks. So there she is. Now, these are all women that are stage 4 metastatic breast cancer. The medical system uh, can do no more for them. They've been sent home and told to put their affairs in order, uh, and they have a life expectancy maybe one year. So these women are dying. And that happens in six weeks. Now, they are on standard of care. And one thing I want to say is ketogenic diets are not a cure for cancer. They have not been proven to do much of anything unless it's adjunct with the standard of care. Most of these women uh, are on Zloter, Taxol. Um, it's a kind of homogenous group. Some are triple negative. Uh, some are HER positive, et cetera. Um, but this is what we're seeing, at least in the short term. So this is a very small sample size, short term. Uh, rather remarkable improvement. Think of the psychological effects on the women that have been told that they're dying, that they cannot go and look at those images and say, well, my cancer is regressing. Right? So uh, just in the last couple minutes here, and I'm going to keep this very low-key and science-y. I don't want you to get run away with this, but, you know, COVID-19 is, is spreading. It's a pandemic now. And remember, this is really just a cold virus. It's a, it's a kind of a cold, cold virus on, on, on steroids. And, and can you have some resistance? Well, you know, the answer is we don't know. You know, it's too early to tell. So what we can do is we can look at SARS, and we can look at other respiratory infections, and we can make some guesses. And as you guys, you know, when you put your hands up, it might answer that question about how come we, we, we see that. So um, this study here, it's really just in the middle uh, there somewhere. It shows you, this is from the COVID-19. Most of the people that are dying from COVID-19 are people that are, have cardiometabolic risk, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, and that makes sense. They're not well. And, uh, and also immune compromised and so on, older people. Um, this study here, this was from uh, Yale, um, shows that a ketogenic diet does confer some immunity to influenza virus, which is a similar respiratory virus. It's not the same virus. And this, by the way, is done on mice, not humans. But what they noticed was this upregulation of what are called gamma delta cells. And gamma delta cells are kind of intermediate. We study the innate immune system. These guys sort of have a foot in both camps, innate and adaptive immune system. And they tend to protect the, uh, the respiratory epithelial cells from infection. And if you look at that second to last line, you can't just use ketones. You actually have to be keto adapted to have this effect. And of course, we don't wa know why that is yet. That was just in November. Um, and this other study, this is now, can SARS hit Vancouver and Toronto pretty heavily. So we have some leading SARS researchers there. Again, about halfway down, you'll see that they've identified and this is where my students would be so mad that Dave, don't put words up and read them. So in the middle of there, it talks about the ACE2 Receptor, that's how SARS gets into your respiratory cells, the ACE2 receptor. That's the angiotensin converting enzyme, you know, the one that Ramipril works against and so on. And so here's a study that came out uh, back a while ago, 2006, that looked at interferon gamma uh, in particular, and interleukin-4, downregulating the SARS receptor. That, and these are Vero uh, E6 cells, so these are green monkey cells. So again, we're talking about monkeys, and, and, uh, but we are this time talking about SARS. 
And in particular, look at the top right and bottom left, and you'll see the interferon gamma, the, the triangle ones are the, uh, are the SARS decreasing, and the square ones are, are the uh, HSV, which is what we use as well, the herpes simplex virus, that's a proxy for cancer cell response. And so this is the diminished cell numbers uh, when those are present. So there's our study, and uh, I don't have time to explain it all to you, except look in the, in the top left, the one second from the left, uh, no, sorry, the one uh, middle row second from the left, that's the interferon gamma being upregulated. These are, these are ketogenically adapted people uh, compared to normal people. And what you're seeing is that upregulation of the immune response, in particular uh, interferon gamma, which uh, may confer some resistance to uh, uh, SARS because it may downregulate uh, ACE2 uh, receptors in our uh, respiratory epithelium completely speculative at this point. You know, it's obviously way too early to, to draw any conclusions, but it's just an indication that the, the, there is some science behind the reason why we don't get these infections like the regular public does. So the answer there, is, uh, maybe, right? And, uh, you know, we'll see, maybe. But uh, I think if you're healthy, that's the best thing. And I think, you know, ketogenic diets aren't for everybody. They're for most people, but not everybody. Um, so this is the adage I like to leave, lead, end with. Uh, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. So that's my book, and uh, there's, you can get in touch with me by email. I uh, wrote it with my wife again, Dale Drury. Uh, Biodiet.org, Dale has put in hundreds of resources. They're, they're, they're very consumable by the general public that, support, that are about ketogenic diets. If you go to the resources tab in there, there's a lot of information. Plus, we've taken everything from our book, all the images and stuff, and you can get those free online at biodiet.org. So please go have a look at that site and, and, and send me an email and, and tell me what you think. And it's available on all the platforms and audio and, and you know, Kindle and, and all that. So listen, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you.